getting started. Welcome to Landmark Church. I am honored to be one of the pastors here. And of course, in light of all those controversial and some would say complicated issues, in light of all of that, there is then this, the signs of the times. With current events, headlines bombarding us on our cell phones, our TVs, it's really hard, and here's the punchline, it's really hard to decipher what is true and what is not. There's a lot of information out there. And with the increase of information comes the increase of deception. And here's why it is important, critical, for the Christian and the church to have a handle on the Word of God because it is the only lens by which we can clearly see the world. You see, in these times, most incredible, and they are, it requires a knowledge and a discernment that only comes from the Bible. So here's where we begin tonight. The Word of God is predictive. A majority of the book is prophetic. It talks about what has happened historically, but it also talks about what is going to happen prophetically. So if it's predictive and it has never missed, the Bible tells no lie. 100% of the prophecies to date have been nailed, whether it's people or places, God never misses. It's predictive. And because it's predictive, it's also prescriptive. Get this, it's prescriptive. When you go to a doctor and there's an ailment, there's a sickness, they often write a prescription. So I don't wanna just know what's going to happen. I don't wanna just know what has already happened. I wanna have the remedy or the wisdom to navigate the things that are happening. Does that make sense? Let's go a little bit deeper. It's predictive. It's prescriptive. It's proactive. The Word of God is proactive. How is it proactive? This book that we call the Holy Bible, the Word of God, Genesis to Revelation, 66 books in one, inspired by the Spirit of God, written by 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years. It's predictive, it's prescriptive, it's proactive, and it's timely. And it's timely because it's timeless. And because it's timeless, it always arrives on time. It doesn't just transcend, it transforms. The Word of God is proactive. It ministers to us where we're at. The Word of God doesn't leave us where we're at. The Word of God proactive, takes me where God needs me, transcends. That's why it's always true. Culture does not determine the truth of Scripture. Did you get that? Transcends. And because it's alive, it's the breath of God, it transforms. It transforms lives. And if we're all in this room being honest with each other, we are all sinners who have been transformed by the grace of a savior. And yes, we may stumble our way through sanctification on our way to the ultimate redemption called salvation. But by and large, I say to this assembly, when you fail and you fall, you do so moving forward. That's it. That doesn't make us perfect. It makes us perfected. God speaks to us through his word. So we're going to look at some interesting topics tonight entitled Signs of the Times. What does that mean? Subtitled Aliens, <laughs> Arsons, and Antichrist Allies. I was going to talk about AI tonight, but that will be a lesson for another time. So where do we begin? If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 16 as well as Matthew 
24. Matthew 16, we'll set the table and then we'll make our way to Matthew 24. The word of God proclaimed. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, that's Jesus, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern, and here's where we get the phrase, the signs of the times. Now, contextually, Jesus is fielding a question from the religious elite. Can you look at me for one second? Those who had a pretty solid handle on the scriptures. So the question is coming from a place where there's a knowledge about the prophecies about the coming Messiah and the people of Israel. So they say to the one who is creating a lot of waves with his teachings and his healings and his miracles and his ragtag group of renegades that he called disciples. And they say to him, show us a sign. Show us a sign from heaven. You know why that is audacious? They're asking the one who is literally, physically, spiritually, not just the sign from heaven himself, he is the son of heaven himself. Well, here's the point. If there's a veil over one's eyes, if there's no spiritual mind, if it's a natural mind, a secular worldview, they'll never be able to see the truth, even if it's standing right in front of them. So we stop and we pause and we praise our God for opening our eyes first and foremost. Lest we think that there's ever a reason for anyone in the church of Jesus Christ to get on a high horse and look down at a world where we once were. No, no, the Lord Jesus Christ picked us up and as we just sang, put us back on solid ground and opened up our eyes for us to see, pertaining to the message, the signs of the times. Show us a sign from heaven. Jesus rebukes them with a analogy as we have it, but an actual reality as it goes and pertains to weather forecasting. So the rebuke goes like this. Hey, when you wake up in the morning and you look at the sky, you can discern what type of day lies ahead based on the weather patterns, based on the clouds in the sky. And we do the same thing. We have technology these days to be able to read the weather radars, but by and large, it doesn't require a rocket scientist to walk out of your house, look to the sky and see clouds building with gray forming and say, I think it's gonna rain today. So Jesus is saying, you can read the skies, you can read the weather, but how come you cannot discern the signs of the times? How are you missing what's happening around you? How is it possible that you're missing what's happening right in front of you? That's what he's saying. Well, how? Well, here's the answer. That's because it takes physical eyesight to forecast the weather, but it requires biblical insight to forecast the world. And this is where people miss it. Physical eyesight can only take you so far. In the words of Dr. Tony Evans, and I've said these words before, if what you see is all you see, then you don't see all you're intended to see. Right? He's saying, if all you're seeing is with the naked eye, the physical eye, then you're missing a world 
that is behind what you see physically. And for the believer, it requires a biblical insight to forecast the world around us. The perfect instrument to illustrate is a telescope. What is a telescope? It's a optical instrument by which one can take things that are far and bring them near. Take things that are blurry and make them clear. That's what the Bible does for the Christian and the church. We are able to look through the word of God, the lens, and by these optics, take that which is far and bring it near. Take that which is blurry and make it clear. Can I say hindsight 2020, pun intended, to the year in the rear, rear view? See, the church, the true church, was not confused during those seasons. With all the headlines and all the noise, the true church that had the telescope was able to take the things that were far and bring them near and to make discerning decisions based on the responsibility and role of the church and the Christian. We were able to take the things that were blurry and confusing and make them clear. Is this making sense? Say amen. amen. Speaking of telescopes, I can assure you that looking through this telescope right here will reveal that aliens, quote unquote, are actually demons. Now, oh, this is where it gets interesting. Because the world you live in right now, some of the headlines are talking about UFOs, un unidentified flying objects, or as the acronym has changed, UAPs, unidentified anomalous phenomena. And now, not to discredit, this is not what this is about, discredit anybody's eyewitness on what they saw. In fact, I would argue, because of the amount of people, pilots, those in the military that have access to classified reports, they saw something. Now, here's why it's interesting and here's why it's critical to discuss from a biblical worldview. It's reached the halls of Congress. So with sworn testimony lately, if you haven't seen the videos, there are people who are testifying that they've not only seen these UAPs, they actually have the remains of an unidentified object, and they even have claimed that they have non-human remains based on that crash site. Interesting. Some have asked me, do you believe in aliens? I say, no, because it's not in the word of God. And because it contradicts what God has said in his word about his creative order and his creation from Genesis 1 and on, the answer is no. No. Now, here's why this is even more important now than ever before is because of the fact that Hollywood for decades has conditioned us in various movies, extraterrestrial movies involving telescopes and space and UFOs and touch points with aliens and them coming down to planet Earth, and we are conditioned to be entertained by these movies, and some people believe that there's life beyond planet Earth. Interesting, right? They claim there's life beyond planet Earth because we found maybe bacteria on planet Mars, and yet the life within a womb is not a life at all. I digress, though. Some of these sci-fi movies include humans getting abducted. In other words, they're here one day, they're gone the next. Now, if that's the conditioning of Hollywood, and now in the halls of Congress, there are those who are credible who are saying, we saw something. And on our radar, it was there, and then the next moment, it wasn't. In fact, it was 60 miles away in a second. We've never seen anything like it, they've said. We don't have the technology. And I go, that's, that's because it's not about the technological advancements of aliens. It's not technological at all. It's about what is spiritual. 
and there is a reality and a world behind the veil. And I am biblically persuaded from my studying that the only possible excuse that would make any sense to anyone to be able to explain away a Christian or Christians being here one day and gone the next. So I am convinced in what Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica that when God decides to call his bride home in what is known as the rapture, which is a catching away or a catching up, the only thing that would make sense to the non-believing world when the dust of that confusion settled was, where did they go? I don't know. We've had contact with aliens and perhaps those, ready for this, the Christians, the true Christians, those radicals, those extremists, those religious zealots, those individuals who were a plague to society. And there would be perhaps a celebration that those types of people were removed. And I'm saying that's the only thing that makes sense. Now, here's what I want to say next. Regardless of what is being claimed in the name of aliens, regardless, and even if it has nothing to do with my biblical stance on the rapture, it's still a form of deception. And why am I touching on this? Because when you hear about it or you read about it, your mind should be conditioned, not by the world, but by the word, to automatically conclude this is deception from the devil himself. I want the Christians that are entrusted to my oversight to be like the sons of Issachar. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it's one verse, it stands alone. It's almost in a genealogy of sorts, but it's not a genealogy, but it talks about the different tribes, how they're coming to the aid of the soon-to-be king. His name was David in light of the controversy and the conflict between David and Saul at that time. And it's one verse, and it says this, of the sons of Issachar, who had an understanding of the times, mark that, understanding of the times that they lived in, to know what Israel ought to do. So these guys, whoever they were, had a spiritual discernment about the times they lived in. And you know there was a very real governmental conflict going on with who would be the next king. Now they previously supported Saul and his lineage and his family, but something at this point in the time caused them to discern the times and then put their full support on King David. Translation, they recognized the hand of God upon David. They understood that God was using him. So how about us? How about us? Can we look out and see a culture context and a government context and see what the Lord is doing? Do we understand the times? Can we even discern what it is the Lord is doing? Now, let me be very clear. The word of God is made up of various timetables. Some of the greatest prophecies in the word of God were built upon timetables. The first coming of Christ, which was nailed to a T. Hundreds of prophecies that dealt with the first coming of Christ. Now, contextually, you ready for this? Hundreds of prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. Almost, no, on the exact date it was predicted in the book of Daniel when the Messiah would come. Now does it make sense when Jesus looks at these religious leaders who had all the knowledge in the world and he says to them, you want a sign? I'm standing right in front of you. The, the other prophecies that are built on timetables, guess what they're in relation to? The second coming of Christ. Timetables that deal with the first coming. And oh, by the way, there's hundreds more prophecies about the second coming and the last days than there are about the first coming. 
then why does the church not address the second coming and the timetable? Maybe more? Jesus already came. He's already established his church. The prophecies of the past only affirm that what I believe is true. So I look at the end days prophecies with timetables, and I want to have a knowledge. Now, now here's the point. Many of us may know these timetables according to Daniel, according to Revelation. You can sit with a theologian and they can cross every T and dot every I theologically and they'll be able to give you chapter and verse on these timetables. But here's the most important application. It doesn't matter if we know all the timelines of the Bible if we don't line up our times with the Bible. Right? Who cares? If you know all about what we call in theology, eschatology, the study of the end times. If you don't have a real and personal relationship with the God of eternity presently, who cares? Who cares if you're able to tell me about the 70th week of Daniel and quote Revelation 6 to 19 and the, the bulls and the seals and the wrath of God, and like, who, if you don't have discernment today to live in light of those prophecies, does that make sense? See, Jesus, in Matthew 24, and we're only going to take the first eight verses as they come, and we're only going to focus on verses seven and eight as they are, but Jesus, in Matthew 24, it tells us, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. The temple was so impressive. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, that means absolutely, I tell you the truth, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. You got to understand something. The temple was the epicenter of religion. If you were a Jew, the temple represented the place where God met with his people. And they looked at it, and the structure was beautiful. Gold-plated, the instruments and the furniture therein was impressive. And it tells us elsewhere in scripture, they walk away saying, wow. And that's what made Jesus say, oh, Oh, you see that? I tell you the truth, not a single stone of that building right there, not a single stone will be left one upon another. You got to understand their minds would have been blown. Their belief, look, look at me, here's why. They knew prophecies that talked about the Messiah coming to establish his kingdom where? In Jerusalem, where? In the temple. So their understanding of the temple was that it had to be there in order for Jesus, the one they're waiting to establish his kingdom on earth, but it wasn't his time. He first came as the savior. He's coming again to establish his kingdom as king of kings and lord of lords. Be patient. Oh, that attraction, that's coming. And the Christian and the church are supposed to be like the trailer in the meantime. You ever watch the movies and before you get into the main feature, they show you two minute, three minute clips of coming attractions. And some of the coming attractions are put together in such a way where they're suspenseful and there's energy and you go, I, I, I wanna see that movie. So what you do is you, you wait for them to launch the movie itself and you buy the ticket and you come back to watch the full feature. Well, I tell you the truth, brothers and sisters, your life is to be the coming trailer to the main attraction. Jesus is coming, and the world's going to get the full feature of that one day. But in the meantime, you're the trailer. You're the few-minute picture of what it means to be a believer. Temple's coming down, and just as Jesus said in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed under Roman rule by General Titus and every single brick and stone of that structure came down. Now we don't have enough time to get into the 
third temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem because the Bible says it will be rebuilt. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to get into what Jesus says in response to the disciples' question. Verse 3, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign, there it is again, of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus said to them, first thing he says, you're curious about the sign of my coming and the end of the world, the end of the age? Take heed that no one deceives you. First thing Jesus said, which means deception is not only going to accelerate, it's going to amp up. It's going to be hard to decipher and discern what is exactly happening in our world. The closer you get to the return of Jesus. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. Jesus is going to, what I say, trace the age that bleeds into the end of days. That's what he's going to do next. He's going to trace the age from 70 AD, from the temple being destroyed, to his return, the second coming. He gives us a few more conditions or signs, if you will, and I'll read it. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. And here's our hint. All these are the beginning of sorrows. That's the verse I want to look at first. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The phrase he chose was intentional. The phrase in the original language lent itself to the birthing process that a woman goes through, the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of contractions, the beginning of birth pangs. And every mom in this room knows that process, approximately nine months long, early on there might be false contractions called Braxton Hicks's, but as you get closer to the third trimester, there are real contractions. I don't have to tell you what a contraction is. You understand in the birthing process, a mom begins to feel the body seize and the pain that vaults through the body. But do you know, and I'm sure moms do, I didn't. What is a contraction? Why is a contraction? What do contractions do? Can I give you a simple definition? Contractions help prepare the body for delivery. Let me say that again so you catch what I'm putting down figuratively. Contractions help prepare the body of Christ for delivery. You understand what I'm saying? And why we should take interest in the signs of the times and the contractions that, according to Jesus, will begin to pick up pace as contractions increase in interval and intensity as they pick up pace and power, you can know labor is advancing to the final hour. That's how you know. Moms, amen? Amen. (laughs) Dads are like, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) But ain't that interesting? Like contractions that pick up in pace and power, they get stronger. There's an interval. There might be a determinate amount of time that passes between contractions, but you better believe, and that's why they tell you, hey, a certain amount of time that passes between the contractions is telling your body something. Now watch this. For the believer, that's you and I, that's the Christian, that's the church, we need to see the beginning of sorrows as the signs that are moving us closer to the wait for it, the ending of sorrows. You know, that's what we call the word hope. Did you get that? Like, so while I know the world is in a terrible state, the Bible tells us it's going in that trajectory, but the Christian should never lose sight of the end result. There is coming a day where my king 
is returning to planet Earth. And there's coming a day where he's going to replace this old world, this old Earth, and he's going to replace it with a new Earth. An old heaven with a new heaven. And on that day, it tells us in his word, there's going to be complete healing of the body. Amen? Amen. There's going to be a drying of every wet eye. Amen? Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like all the misery, all the pain, all the regret, all the bitterness, all the hurt, all the guilt, everything that you've gone through. When you begin to see the world picking up pace, what I want you to do is say, all right, we're getting closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the beginning of sorrows are actually signs for me to keep my eyes on Jesus because one day it's going to lead to the ending of sorrows. See, the pain of childbirth is not endured without the hope of new life. Did you get that? The pain that a mom goes through, there's an end result. There's the joy of a new child. So what are we to do? Well, we need to continue to look for Christ. Here's the equation. Those who are looking for Christ, living to look for Christ are those same people who are living for Christ. That's the translation of the equation. If you're looking for Christ, you're living for Christ. How many times in the scriptures does Jesus say, like a thief in the night? Nobody knows when a thief in the night, that's why they're coming at night, they're coming unassuming, they're coming unexpected. And Jesus is like, hey, that's going to be very similar to when I return. So live watchful, be watchful, be ready. Live in such a way that you know eternity could invade your space at any moment. How many of us in this room, if we knew eternity was about to invade our space any moment, that we would hold loosely to that which is temporary, even relationships. By and large, those are the things materially in life, relationally in life, financially in life that we hold on tightly to. And because we're holding so tightly to the things of the world, we completely miss what God is trying to do in our world. John writes this, beloved, now we are children of God. When? Now. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, hope. But we know that when he is revealed, second coming, we shall be like him, look for him, live for him, for we shall see him as he is. He's coming. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Did you get that? Whoever looks for Christ and his return and lives in light of eternity, there's this purifying effect in the believer's life. There's also an endurance and a perseverance that exists in the Christian when you trust completely in God's providence. See, trusting in God's providence that he's in control of everything happening, even all the contractions. He's moving humanity to its conclusion. If you trust God has a plan for your life, not just globally speaking, I'm talking about personally speaking, trusting in God's providence produces perseverance. And we are going to need perseverance in these days that we currently live in. Why? Because Jesus said, nation will rise against nation. That's happened. It's happening. It will happen. Kingdom against kingdom. That's happened. It's happening. It will happen. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. I'm going to take my time moving through these. Famines. Interesting study on your own time. Look up the famines that are recorded in the Bible. But then look at what God was doing in the midst of the famines recording in the Bible. Does that make sense? This helps frame what we call biblical worldview. So yes, there is great destruction when it comes to natural disasters. And thinking of a human starving to death, literally, should break our hearts. And unfortunately, and fortunately, it's an interesting dichotomy. If we live in the United States of America, we have no idea what it means to be starving. 
Now I know there's poverty. Don't miss what I'm saying. Our country amongst maybe only a handful that are democratic democracies are the only countries made up of people who have never experienced a famine. Did you know that? Famines have always existed, but here's the point. The frequency by which famines ravage the world is what Jesus is mentioning here. As contractions are picking up pace, he says famines are going to increase around the world. Two of the greatest famines happened at the end of the 1950s and the end of the 1990s. So the 20th century, after World War I and World War II, and we'll get to that in a second, the greatest famine ever in human history was the Great Famine of China. And did you know it wasn't war-based? A lot of wars create famines. In fact, that was a strategy by the Babylonians to cut off Jerusalem. Do you remember it? They sieged the city. They cut off all their food supply. And it tells us there was a great famine and people, they died from starvation. But this great famine in China from 1959 to 1961, 62, that took close to 50 million people. Oh, the Chinese government has said, no, no, it wasn't that bad. It was only about two to three million. Two to three million? It was man-made. How do you like that? How do you like that? The greatest famine ever in human history was man-made by a dictatorial government that was attempting to control the food supply of the people eventually led to the deaths of millions of her own citizens. Man-made. Manufactured by man. Evil man is capable of atrocities unimaginable. Communism did that. The second was North Korea. Same song, same dance. They said the government themselves, it led to 200,000, 300,000 deaths. And that's two governments that don't disclose their information, even to this day. Estimates say it wasn't 200,000, 300,000, it was two to three million. The devastation of famines that are taking place right now across the world in countries like Africa. Famines that are ravaging people, picking up pace, many of which are built upon man trying to take territory for himself, wars, always results in famines. Some governments that believe in their leaders taking care of the people, taking the property from the people, moving from uh, capital, free enterprise to socialism. Let's share what we have, which always, without a doubt, get this, rolls over to communism, always. There is no reference in history where socialism has not rolled over to communism and destroys people. Famines always are related to pestilences, right? Usually with war, there's famines. And then when there's dead bodies laying in the streets, there's pestilences. We know there are pestilences that have different sources, whether it's animals and diseases come. There's Diseases that are incurable today that we have no idea where they come from. They just show up in the body. They're uncurable. There are pestilences that are ravaging the world as we speak. The closest pestilence that this land has navigated was from 2020 on. It's called COVID. Now, it makes no different. Look at me. It makes no difference whether you believe that pestilence called COVID was made in a lab in Wuhan, China. So whether it was manufactured, listen to me, here's a biblical worldview. Cause I don't go down no rabbit trail. I'm not getting lost in no black hole. The Bible brings me back to go, I don't care if it was manufactured by a sinner in a lab. Eventually when it makes its way and begins to touch lives, it's manipulated by sinners. So they, whether they're manufacturing it, you better believe evil men manipulate it. Manipulate it? Yeah. 
Hindsight 2020. The moment governments, and here's why this is interesting and should be curious for the Christian, and I said it before and I'll say it again, anything that requires global compliance should make the Christian very curious. Anything. See, when Jesus was saying all this, there wasn't a way for having situations that would be known by everyone everywhere at the same time. We have the technology to be going, oh my goodness, this is happening across the world in every continent at the same time. And then to see governments, evil men, try to take advantage of a virus and to have big pharma try to profit, sinners profiting off of a virus. I brought it up in the midst of 2020. I brought it up in 21. I brought it up in 22. I bring it up in 23 because I said, evil people do evil things. And if they're not harnessed by heaven, you do the math. They are whether they realize they're not harnessed by hell. And what I know about Lucifer is that he's depicted as a serpent in Genesis 3. And that's kind of where we get the slang when somebody is sly, sneaky, cunning. We say, you're a snake. You're a snake. Like a boa constrictor. You know what a boa constrictor does to eliminate its prey? It's fascinating. I always thought it was about suffocation. It's not. Because you can still have a pulse and be suffocated. The boa constrictor finds its prey and it wraps its body around the prey and it constricts tightens up, squeezes. What it's doing is cutting off the blood circulation. Now we're on to something. See, the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And he doesn't care how he does it. He's going to do it. So he comes in like that boa constrictor, and he wraps himself around a body. And he begins to squeeze. And you know when the squeeze is on, but you also can feel when the squeeze is up. And a lot of the times the prey, what they do is they try to gain their composure or reconfigure their body, just as you would if somebody had you in a headlock and they kind of let up their grip, you would try to get out of it. And that's what happens. The prey begins to loosen up. And what happens is, spiritually speaking, we felt the squeeze in 2020 and 21, and then we begin to become relaxed in the midst of it. And we're like, okay, things seem to be going back to normal, but I hate to break it to you. We're not going back to normal. So what's going to happen is that serpent, that boa constrictor, he's going he's to wait until you get comfortable. And then he comes in and squeezes even tighter. And what I have to say to you is if you stood down in 2020, you better stand up in 23 and 24. Because if the rumor mill be true, There are people conniving right now, waiting for the next strand, the next virus to be the announcement that the world has to go on lockdown. There are certain organizations already setting up their procedures to go back on lockdowns and to reinstitute masks. It's happening. It's happening. And with an election cycle approaching, you better believe. Earthquakes. Earthquakes have increased in interval and intensity from the time Jesus said this at a rapid rate. You can look this up. Just Google earthquakes and you will see on the Richter scale, a seven is really the gauge. It's, it's a devastating earthquake. Just had one on the West Coast. A seven or an eight or nine, the amount of those earthquakes from the moment Jesus said this, it was rare, maybe one every hundred years. Now it's like one every decade. What's happening is the contractions, right, are beginning to intensify. 
And of course, as of late, fires. Same thought about famines. Same thought about pestilences. Whether it's man-made, whether there's arsons actually starting the fires, whether there are evil powers that be that are manipulating the weather, and they do. It's called weather modification. It's a real thing. You can look it up. It's called cloud seeding. And I'm going, if they're using that for good reasons to get more rain for the harvest, why do we often give humanity the benefit of the doubt? Evil's going to do whatever evil has to do to accumulate power and control and money. That's a biblical worldview. Fowers in Maui, of course, man, we pray for families that are impacted by every natural disaster, no matter what. But what does a biblical worldview have to do with these natural disasters? See, that's what you've missed if you're not getting it yet. Behind every natural disaster is a spiritual reality. You can never separate the two. I can give you a couple examples, just a couple, right? When it comes to weather and storms and tornadoes and twisters and fire falling from heaven, okay? Job chapter one, give it a read. Where you been, Satan? You know, walking to and fro on the entire earth. Have you considered my servant Job? Because I know you've been walking to and fro and I've seen you sniffing on his property. Of course I've considered your servant Job, but does he not have a hedge of protection around him? You protect him, therefore, of course, he's going to bless you. Okay, have at it. Now, paraphrasing, translation mine, you can read it. God says to Satan himself, all that he has is under your authority. There is no other authority but God's. And Satan himself cannot transgress the commandments of God unless God allows him. And if God allows him, God is going to do a work through him. So even the greatest form of evil, the devil himself, cannot transgress the boundaries of the sovereignty of God. And what happens when you read next is there was bands of Chaldeans and this other foreigner that come and raid Job's property. But there's two interesting natural disasters. Job doesn't know that it's provoked by Satan himself. We are given a picture or a preview. Uh, a, we're able to look into the window of heaven. And what happens is there's a twister, a natural disaster. And it also says there's fire that falls from heaven, a natural disaster. So there's always a spiritual reality. Jesus gets on a boat. He falls asleep. The disciples in the midst of a great storm a tempest, natural disaster, waves. They wake him up. Do not care about us. We're drowning. Jesus wakes up and he speaks to the storm. And the Greek language tells us the force by which he spoke to that storm. He said, be still. He rebuked the storm, which tells us that that storm was probably provoked by the devil himself. There was a spiritual provoking of what otherwise looks like a natural disaster. Jesus knew it. He sent his disciples into it because it was a test. All these are tests, the things that happen around us, including fires. See, there's a whole group of people, non-believer, secular, humanists, environmentalists. They don't see these natural disasters as a world in rebellion against Father God. No, they see these natural disasters as a world in ruin because we've not paid homage to Mother Earth. So there's the evil man leveraging natural disasters. And that's all you'll hear in the news. That's all you'll hear. Climate change, global warming. Global warming is a thing. Just not in the way Greta Thunberg wants you to think. No, no, Peter course corrects that thought. Oh, global warming's coming. Yeah, one day this entire thing is going to burn up and it says that God is reserving. He's reserving judgment by way of fire melting all the elements. And you know why Peter writes that? You know what the context is in 2 Peter? The scoffers say, you guys have been talking about Jesus coming back forever. He ain't coming. Nothing's changed since the beginning of time. 
Time passes, humanity exists, we come, we go, Jesus ain't coming, that whole Bible thing's a farce, it's a bunch of fables, it's not real, to which Peter's like, that's what you think? Have you forgotten about the flood? Have you forgotten about the days of Noah? Have you forgotten about this world was created, pulled out of water, water surrounds it, it is water and bodies of land, and yet the Lord baptized it in his wrath, sparing one family, Noah by name, who was pure in his generation, which means God was going to restart humanity through a man because of the prophecy in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, the promised seed of Eve, the Messiah would eventually come and he destroyed all of mankind. And a lot of people have a hard time stomaching that. What they don't understand is just as a owner of a pet who loves that pet, has authority over that pet. God has authority over his creation. He is creator. We are creature. And what happens when that pet comes home and it has been bit by some type of animal that had a disease and it has rabies and now you'd be a fool. And I would tell you to your face, you're a fool if you bring that rabid animal around your children because one bite of your child and now your child is harmed. Nobody would do that. No, with great grief, we'd take that animal to the vet and we'd put that animal down and that would be the right thing to do. And what I'm saying to you is, God, who is creator to creature, and if creature does not want to receive salvation and look to him, and we're rabid because of sin, and we get worse, and we cause more evil, it's God's prerogative to put sinful man down. That's why this message called the gospel is so important. Do you understand that? That's why contractions picking up pace, I go, time's running out. The sands of time... So I guess I'll summarize it by saying this. If it feels like the world is on fire, that's because Satan is an arsonist. You don't got to figure out the cause of the fires, right? Is the government doing it? Maybe. I wouldn't put it past them. Are they causing all these natural disasters? Maybe. Wouldn't be surprised. But even if they're not, there's a spiritual reality behind them. Verse seven, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Interestingly, there's two categories here. The first is ethnos or ethnicity. So nation, which is a group of people who come from a similar ethnos. It's exactly the word. Or they come from a similar culture. We know it in English as the nation. Jesus, when you see nations rising against nation, it's one of the signs of the times. It's one of the contractions. Now, before Jesus, nation rose against nation. That comes with sinful man, right? Now, we, a hundred years ago, give or take, ours is the generation that knows very well what world wars look like and the devastation that is caused. That is the epitome of nation against nation. Okay, two of them. Presently, you can say Ukraine and Russia is nation against nation. Okay, you can say Iran and Israel is nation against nation. And here's where we get called up. And I'm helping us think biblically. Notice I haven't taken any sides about, is that the source of it? Who's right, who's wrong? Who's right and who's wrong when it comes to Russia and Ukraine? <laughs> I got an idea. Let's give billions of dollars to another country to protect their borders and yet allow our borders to be completely wide open. That's a good idea. Brilliant. I'll get to that next. So, so, so Christian, look at me. Who's right or wrong? Is Ukraine right? Is Russia wrong? You're looking at it wrong. Let me take you backwards before I take you forward. We know from the book of Jeremiah, which we just got out of on Thursday nights, I hope you get this, Babylon was raised up by God. We know that. Babylon didn't know that. Israel only knew that because Jeremiah was saying that. Otherwise, they thought there was another nation trying to dominate their nation. 
we are told that Babylon was wrong, yet God still was going to use them. We are told Israel was wrong. <laughs> so God was going to use wrong to right a wrong. Which means you cannot jump to conclusions when you hear about nation against nation. You don't know what God is doing. All you know is God can use anyone. He can use unrighteous rulers to accomplish his righteous rule. So as a Christian, I just go, I'm not going to take sides on this. I, I weep and I grieve for casualties of war and those that are innocent in the grand scheme of evil nations coming against each other. Whether it's Ukraine or Russia, I look back and I, I step back and I go, all right, there's, there's a chess game happening and God is playing it and he is moving the players on the board to bring it all to its conclusion. And yeah, there's a real enemy who is in the midst of it all thinking that he's going to usher in his kingdom on earth and he will, but it's short-lived and it's temporary, which leads me to my next point, kingdom against kingdom, completely different category than nation against nation. Kingdom is Political. It's exactly what it means. So when it says kingdom against kingdom, it's saying politics against politics or political systems against political systems. Here's what we do in these United States of America. We hear the word politics and we form two camps, Republican or Democrat. And I've taken a lot of fire the past several years for bringing forth biblical principles as they pertain to the political realm. And sadly, because they are Christian conservative values, you're automatically clumped into a category of Republican. And what I've been saying to this fellowship, and I'll keep beating that drum, is the more you stand for Christ, the more you will find yourself a kingdom independent, in the words of Dr. Tony Evans, okay? That doesn't mean you disengage. That doesn't mean that you remove yourself. It means when we come to a voting cycle, we vote our biblical values. And it's that simple. It's that simple. It's not a personality contest. Because policies matter. Christ's kingdom is built on policies. His politics are pure, built on righteousness. So I want to, as closely as I can, align my life with his kingdom. Now, with that being said, we're watching political classes collide, but not just in America. And this is what you might not know, globally, okay? There's something happening on the global scale, right? There are antichrist allies that are currently taking shape. It's interesting, because politics against politics there's a greater reality behind those politics, and it's kingdom against kingdom, but it's the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. It's the kingdom of the Antichrist against the kingdom of Christ. So when you know that, you're beginning to see as it materializes, okay, what's happening in front of me? Now, you got to know that in Australia, people reach out to me, and they're experiencing the same type of political trauma that the, um, these United States are experiencing, people from Canada who watch online, God bless you guys, who reach out to me, who say they're experiencing the same form of tyranny in Justin Trudeau that Australia is experiencing. Did you know there was prosecutorial persecution politically in Brazil with their governmental structure? And you're seeing two ideologies collide. And of course, in America, you are currently wit witnessing something that is unprecedented and is extremely alarming and should have every Christian on guard and aware. And here's the that reality, the moment you begin to call it out, people begin to couple you and place you in that camp. Are you a MAGA? No, I don't care about making America great. I care about making the church godly. And Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu, for the past couple years after he was able to win the election, their government was in shambles. Shouldn't have been the candidate, eventually had the, the majority vote. From those that are on the ground in Israel who are Christians, who have a biblical worldview, one by name, Amir Sarfati, you, you would love to follow him. He's constantly giving updates from the Middle East. He has a biblical worldview. He will tell you, as he witnessed 
What is happening in Israel is awfully similar to what is happening in America. The prosecution, politically speaking, against their prime minister, who he says is one of the best prime ministers they've ever had, pro-Israel, pro-Christian, pro-church, trying to do the right thing in the Holy Land, is exactly the playbook that is being executed on Donald Trump. Now, say what you want about Donald Trump. What is happening has set a precedence that is extremely dangerous, and if you don't think it is, that one of the most powerful, humanly speaking, men in the world has been indicted four times based on no evidence. And immediately, the critic says, are you supporting him? It's not about that. It's about not supporting what is happening to him. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can go on about that point. But I just want you to see that globally this is happening. There are two systems colliding. And here's what Jesus had to say about it. And here's how I'll kind of land the plane. Jesus cast out some demons. The religious leaders came to Jesus and said, he is Beelzebub. Right? That was a derogatory, demonic term. Jesus said to them, really? Because I cast out a demon? Don't you understand? A house divided against itself cannot stand? What good would it be for Satan to cast out a demon? Are you understanding? There's two kingdoms that are colliding. And the same is happening right now. So what I'm asking you to do is to step back and take a breather and ask yourself, What is happening before my very eyes? Which systems are colliding? And then move even further back and say, okay, which one is more in line with the kingdom of darkness? And which one is the Lord probably trying to push forth his kingdom of light? I don't know. There are certain people I can rattle off that no matter what they say, I can probably believe the opposite without doing any research. You know why? Because if you miss the issue about life in the womb and you miss the biological significance of males and females, and if you miss the biblical definition of a man and a woman in marriage, if you miss the idea behind justice, biblically speaking, if you didn't understand the fact that having a national identity is also biblical and it's a good thing, it protects its people and borders are a good thing. If you missed all those issues, then why in the world would I now on this new issue go, you know what? Maybe you're telling the truth. No. So if the current political system in power, the Biden administration or his woke associates or the Marxist mainstream media, if they say it or they support it, I believe the opposite. Before I make any moves, I just go, nope, probably something else happening. And I'm going to look into it, biblically speaking, and ask the spirit to discern so I can know the signs of the times. This does not mean we blindly believe the other political side. No, this means this. Behind every political viewpoint is a spiritual touch point. There it is. All right, let's wrap it up. My time is running out. Why did we go through all these? And I stopped on aliens and arsons and antichrist allies. And I didn't want to go too far because I could talk about this stuff all night long. But I wanted to prepare the church of Jesus Christ. I wanted you to understand the purpose of the signs of the times is not to scare you. It's to prepare you. It's not to scare anyone. It's to prepare the body for delivery. We can use physical eyesight to forecast the weather, but we are called to have biblical insight to forecast the world. Doesn't matter if you can line up, the, if you know the timelines of the Bible, if you cannot line up your times with the Bible, there's hope here. The beginning of sorrows are the signs that are leading us and pushing us to the ending of sorrows. Our God in Christ is returning for his people and there's much to accomplish and steward until then. So I'll take something I said way back in the day and I'll add a new flavor to it. And you've heard it before, but I haven't said it in a while. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it by God's grace. Let's do it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, O God, for your word declared. Thank you that we have access to your truth. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Thank you for giving us spiritual eyes and minds to see and know what it is you're doing 
around us, but more importantly, what you're doing within us. Allow us to stand for the gospel, to share truth with a world that is wrapped up in lies, to see people saved. Oh God, that's what you've put us here for until the end of days. We trust you. We love you. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen.